Hey there, Grace Church. So glad you were joining us today. My name is Justin, and uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. But before we do, uh, if you're like me, these past couple months have been really hard to connect with people. And so we would love to connect with you. If you're new here, maybe you've been showing up and, uh, and watching online a hundred times, but you never really connected with us, we would love for you to text connect me to 411-247. And that's also a great way to send in prayer requests. You can text connect me, no spaces, 411-247 and send in your prayer requests or just get to connect with us here at Grace Church. We would love to, to meet you and know what's going on in your life right now. And uh, you might be wondering, why do we have a bunch of little humans up here? Well, these are my friends. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. But, you know, we haven't heard a lot from kids over the past few months. And we thought it'd be really fun to interview them and kind of get to know what's been going on during this crazy season. And so uh, I'm going to introduce you guys real quick. And then we're going to ask them some questions and see what they have to say. So right here, can you introduce yourself? My name is Roman and I'm 10. Awesome. And this is your sister, right? All right, what's your name? My name is Violet and I am 7. Awesome. And then what's your name? My name is Zechariah, and I'm also seven. Awesome. My name is Mariah, and I'm ten. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. Uh, I have a couple questions. Are you guys, first off, are you excited to be up here? Yeah? You don't sound very excited. Are you excited? Yeah. Awesome. I'm so excited to see what you guys have to say. Here's our first question, which is, uh, you know, over these past few months, what is something that you have learned? I'm going to start over here. Um, that Jesus is there no matter what. That's an awesome answer. What about you, Zechariah? Um, what COVID is. We, we've all been learning that. All right, what about you, Violet? That uh, your parents always love you. Also a great answer. All right, Roman. Uh, how to do online school. Yes, yeah, online school and Zoom. That's been a hard one for a lot of us. I'm still learning. So, Okay, second question. You ready? Okay, so, uh, you know, you guys have, most of you have been doing online school, right? Okay, so I'm just going to let you know, your parents can't get mad at you for your answer to this question. So my question is, what is the worst part, and you can even say the best part, about having your parents as your teacher? I'm going to start with Roman. Uh, the best part is that they're always helping me. The worst part is that when I need them to help me, they're doing something else. I get that. I get that. What about you, Violet? Uh, the best part is also that they always help me. And when I, sometimes when I'm in a Zoom meeting, they talk and yell a lot. And my teacher says, what's that noise? And I say, I don't know. <laughs> Being a distraction in Zoom meetings. Come on, parents. All right. What about you, Mariah? Um, one of the best things is that they're always there. And one of the worst things is that they're doing two jobs at once. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Try having to split their time, that's got to be hard. Well, those were great answers. Last question for all of us is this. Do you have any advice for all of the parents who are watching out there? You've got a captive audience right now. What would you want the parents to know? I'm going to start over here this time with Zechariah. Um, get me more toys. Get Zechariah more toys. All of you parents, I'll send you his address. You can send him all the toys. What about you, Mariah? Um, you want me to come back? All right, think about it. I know you have it. I'm going to come back. Violet. Uh, that when your kids ask something that they want, just give it to them and don't care. Give your kids whatever they want. Great advice. Roman. Parents. Let your kids do whatever they want every day for two hours. Two hours of free time. I love that. Mariah. Um, if your kids get in trouble, try to look at their side of you. Yeah, seeing both sides. That is great advice from our kids up here. Well, hey, guys, thank you so much for joining me today. If you were just tuning in, uh, we're so excited. Service is going to start in just a few seconds. Wanted to remind you, you can text connect me to 411-247 to get connected here and also send in your prayer request.
Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to invite you to sing with us, worship with us. Come on, let's sing together. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never
Day, gathered all over the city, all over the world to praise the name of Jesus Christ. We're gathered through technology, but we're still together and we're so glad that you're there. Would you pray with me? We just want to pray for each other. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you that we can gather even when we're not in the same room, that with unity of purpose, because of what Jesus did for us, that you can bind us together in love, God. So may love abound this morning. And, and God, as we consider each other, the people that we know, the people that we don't, we just acknowledge, first of all, you as in control. We trust you. You are mighty and capable, and you know exactly what's going on even in the midst of chaos. So we acknowledge you as creator. And then, and then you ask us to present our requests. So for those who are watching, who are sick, who are lonely, who are depressed, who are dealing with addiction and all other sorts of struggles, God, would you meet us where we're at? And in the name of Jesus, would you heal us? Would you heal our land? One prayer request that came in is for a, a man who's very close to a leader in this congregation. His name is Mark. He fell off a ladder, a tragic, tragic brain injury. He's fighting to get his life back right now so that he can live out the rest of his days with his wife and his daughter, God, for Mark. Would you heal him? We know that you can, and we ask that you will. And, and for that, we will glorify your name and give you all the honor and glory for everyone else who's out there thinking of a specific person. God, would you hear their prayers? And would you heal our land? We love you so much, and we're here to lift your name high. Have your way with us this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it's so good to be together, and there is a lot going on, a lot coming up at Grace Church. Here's what we're doing. We're not focusing on what we cannot do. We're looking for what we can do. So starting tonight, we will start gathering right here on campus for Communion 450. Uh, 6 o'clock and 7.15 every night this week until Wednesday. So to sign up, all you need to do is text the day of the week that you'd like to come. I'm here to say that tonight at 6 is all full and 7 is almost full, 7.15. So um, we'll be closing those very soon, but there's still room on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 6 o'clock or 7.15. We'll have 50 socially distanced chairs here and we'll ask you to wear masks. You can take the mask off to partake of the elements which are very safely and sanitarily packed in one little packet. So I invite you to come worship one night this week. If you don't sign up and you show up, 
and there's room after we've let everyone on the list in. We would love to let you in. If not, you can sit out on the patio and partake out there. So we're excited for that. Secondly, next weekend, not next weekend, I'm sorry, two weeks from today, August 9th is hot August Sunday. So Hot August Nights isn't happening in Reno Sparks uh, this year, but Hot August Sunday at Grace Church is on. We will have a drive through experience. Here's the deal. We have a lot of friends of Grace who have some really sweet rides, and we're all looking for a way to have fun. So we will provide those out in the parking lot along with a few more surprises, and it will be a drive through experience um, with just a couple of surprises at the end. One thing we'll be doing on Hot August Sunday Sunday, as well as at the communion services, is we'll make uh, shoes available for you to purchase for people that really need them. Uh, in faith, we went out and bought 800 pairs of Adidas that we need you to, to purchase so that we can distribute those on Reno Love Day. So uh, they're $35. You can buy them either at communion or at the church office Monday through Thursday from 9 to 5 at Hot August Sunday, or even online. When you just go to Give to Grace, just choose the drop-down menu that says shoes, and you can purchase them that way. These shoes will go to people that really need them. We invited the people that came through Food for Families on Friday to come to Idle Wild Park on Reno Love Day and pick up some free, really nice Adidas shoes. So, that means that, yes, Reno Love Day is happening on August 23rd. We're not just going to gather for online church Sunday morning. We are going to go into the city and be the church by cleaning up Idle Wild Park, just like we did last year, and we'll invite people to come in and get those, uh, those shoes. So if you're ready to come out, uh, we are ready for you. We'll be masked up just for registration, and then as we socially distance and work hard throughout the park, you can drop your mask for a little bit so you can breathe. We want everyone to continue breathing. And uh, we'll just clean up that park and show the city of Reno that Jesus Christ is real. So we'll get you more details on that as we get closer and work those out. But we'll be excited to see you there. We can do all of these things um, because people like you give. And we believe that giving is one of the best ways to worship God because the Bible says it changes your heart. So every week, we want to give you the opportunity to contemplate that, to listen to God, and to give as he leads. So there are instructions on the screen. We'll let you do that and just want to say thanks for being here today.
Hey, Grace Church, how you doing today? Hope you're having a great day. We have a special treat for you today. All the way from South Carolina, we have my new friend, Morris Morrison. So, uh, Morris, where are you? He's coming up here in just a second. Amen. Goodness gracious. You know, I had a chance to be at Elevation Church this past year on March 1st when they debuted this song. And I stood there, and the moment I heard that song, I thought to myself, I said, there are more people who are going to come to Christ because of that song and Christians who are already out there who claim to be believers who are going to draw closer because of that song. Wow, you all sound absolutely, positively amazing. There are people throughout this world who make the gospel of Jesus Christ possible. A lot of times they're behind the scenes. Have a great, great worship team like this. I thank God for Grace Church Reno. I thank God for the fact that that song we just sung, I thank God for my former pastors, Stephen and Holly Furtick from Elevation Church, which means I also want to make sure I say thank you to my current pastors, pastors Greg and Josh Surratt from Seacoast Church in South Carolina. And you know why I'm at it. You know, because the simple point is this. There are a lot of us who get a chance to live and breathe because of people who sacrificed before us. And sometimes we never know who those people are. So I want to be really clear about this. You know, if I'm thanking pastors, I got to thank Pastor Robert Morris from Dallas. I got to thank Larry Titus. I got to thank Pastor Wesley Dobbs. I got to thank Pastor Farrell Lemmings. But there's someone specific that I desperately need you all to know about. Two individuals who weren't pastors, but they, they shared the ministry and the gospel more than anyone I've ever seen. Their names was Eddie and Francis White from a small town called Fairmont, West Virginia. Now, this is the place where when I lost my parents in New York City, this is the place where I was taken where they felt like my life could be safe. I could have a life. Eddie was a coal miner from West Virginia, hard worker. 
Now, there was this little church on Maple Avenue called the Church of God in Fairmont that probably in all reality should have closed even before I was born. But here's what Eddie would do. Eddie would take some of his hard-earned money as a coal miner and they used that money to keep this church open so that all of these people could come and just worship at the Church of God or Maple Avenue. And when I say all of these people, I mean about 10 little kids, Johnny Woods, Tanisha Woods, Devon, Ronnie, Morris Morrison, Bam Bam. Yes, his name was Bam Bam, and there was Dwight White. So listen, yes, I have a cousin, Dwight White, a cousin named Bam Bam, and my name is Morris Morrison, and you guys are thinking, what's wrong with West Virginia? But here's what they would do just to draw us and trap us and get us to church. They would bring uh, grape soda, orange soda, chips, and they would bring something called pepperoni rolls. Now, I don't expect you all to identify with that, but it is definitely a West Virginia thing. Pepperoni rolls. But here's what I want you to know. This photo you're about to see right here is the first time I got a chance to stand in front of an audience. Now, today as a professional speaker, as an author, an entertainer, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. But this photo right here was the first time I got to say a Bible verse and, and speak about Jesus. And this was the moment in my life when I believed this simple gospel that a virgin named Mary gave birth to a child that she would name Jesus who would go on and live a, a sinless life and die a sinner's death on a cross and rise three days later so that we could have this moment right now. It all happened in this small little church of God because of the, the, the sacrifice of a West Virginia coal miner named Eddie White and his wife, Frances. See, this is important. See, this is one of those moments where I'm still trying to figure out in my life the gravity of that moment, what I'm supposed to do with the rest of my life like many of you are. But I will tell you this. I know this for a fact. As you guys get ready to turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, we're going to go to God's word here in a moment, but I want you to go ahead and get ready to flip your phone. Some of you at home right now, some of you are in the car listening to this right now, some of you just did a chest set at the gym and you stepped aside from your reps, you stepped out of the gym because you're tuning in right now. This isn't just Reno, this is happening throughout the world right now because see, that's where Jesus is. And I'm thankful for this virtual opportunity because we get a chance to reach people like we never would have before, never. But I want you to know this. I believe the simple message of Jesus. I believe it. I believe what happened in that small church in the church of God in Maple Avenue. Something else I want you guys to see. You know, I figure I got to say this just because the world is all about self-identifying. The world is, has, has made this thing now something where everyone has to identify themselves and tell people what they believe in. So let me, let me transition and make sure you understand how I self-identify. I'm going to give you a couple examples, okay? First of all, I identify as a Christian first. All right, Christian, not a non-Christian, not a non-believer. I identify as a Christian first. Second, after that, I identify as a black male, not a white male, not Hispanic male, but I identify as a black male. Uh, I identify as a foster child, as an orphan, because that was part of my story. I identify as an American, this proud country that we live in. But it's also important, and it's going to confuse you, I identify as both a New Yorker and a West Virginia. I got some other weird things that I identify as. I identify as a hope dealer, not a dope dealer, even though the dopamine fires in the brain. I identify as a speaker, author, entertainer. Uh, uh, I identify as an athlete, as a basketball player. I also identify as an intermittent faster. That's a new label that we have nowadays. I know some people in the audience right now, I know personally who are trying to identify as an intermittent faster so they can get in better shape. But see, I'm curious. I'm curious how you would identify yourself to the world around you. I'm curious when you're with your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, do you identify yourself as a Christian? Is that something they know about you? Because I know here just a few weeks ago, your pastor Dan said something I thought was amazing. He said he believes that we should identify as Christians even before we identify as Americans. Especially for those of us who say we believe in Jesus. But I want you to know why I believe in God more than anything. I want you to see this photo right here. Listen, this is the photo of my girls right here. I identify mainly as Lisa's husband and Dory and Aaliyah's dad. It's one I'm more famously known as. These girls, they rock my world. They set my life on fire. You know what? They are everything to me. But there's another photo that I want you to see. I want you to see this photo of who, who I call my crew. 
So these guys right here are my crew, all right? So you're looking at, you're looking at Damien, you're looking at Jermaine, you're looking at Lewis, and of course me on the end. But there's a reason I'm showing you this. Now, the whole crew is in here. You don't see Andy Johnson. You don't see Josh Cope. You don't see Jason B. You don't see Nikki C. You don't see DeVerl D. Nasty. And you don't see the real Ken Jones or the Merchant Brothers. That's not important. Here's what you do see here. Here's why I love being a Christian. What you see right here on the end of this photo in blue is my boy Ty. Now, right now, Ty is suffering from what we would call stage four cancer. And the prognosis from the doctors is not good. But see, one of the reasons I love, Karen, being a Christian and identifying as that label is I know that right now there are people tuning in from around the world who are watching this message. And I know what happens when we decide as a family to come together in the name of Jesus to pray. This photo that you see of my boy Ty, he's smiling for a reason because he has hope. And if you guys in the days and weeks to come can join me in praying for him, I'm expecting a miracle. Everybody repeat it. Say expecting a miracle. I'm going to say this. Listen, I know COVID's been rough on some people. And and I don't want to make light of a rough situation. We've lost a lot of people. But let's be honest. The comedian me also acknowledges that COVID has brought us a lot of funny moments also. You see how weird some people wear their masks? It's crazy. Now we got mask shaming out there. But let me tell you what happened at dinner last night. Last night I'm sitting at dinner. And this is the dilemma I have, and especially when I'm around Christian households. We're getting ready to eat this amazing spread, and then someone said, let's join hands for prayer. And we joined hands, and we prayed over this amazing meal. And just after we prayed, I was ready to eat, and then I realized, I don't know them like that. <laughs> so I got this little trick I've been doing. I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss myself. And I'm going to go to the bathroom, wash my hands. This has been my little trick when I'm eating with people when we pray because it's Christian. I go to the bathroom, I come back, and I'm like, all right, I'm all good. I'm digging into the steak right now. And then all of a sudden right there in that moment, someone said, hey, can you pass the salt and pepper for me? I was like, oh, sure, you know, I got you. Here you go, bam. And I realized, oh, I touched it. I touched it. I'm against the COVID. And I got upset. So so don't don't think it's weird if y'all see me out to dinner. Those of you watching this, if you ever see me out to dinner and you see me and you see the whole table next time praying in Jesus' name, thank you for this food. Don't be be surprised if I'm in public like, dear Jesus, I love you so much. Thank you for this food. COVID has brought us some moments, but the best moment for me was my daughter, little Dory, my little gummy bear. I had a rough day. And yes, question people ask me when I do a QA and a session all the time, they'll say, they'll say, You know, Morris, what do you do when you get down? And I would love to say I'm super Christian and I always pray like I should, but you know we don't. We never pray enough. Had a rough day during COVID and I was sitting there. I said, listen, my whole tour schedule, my speaking schedule has been wiped clean for most of the year. I was feeling dejected a little bit because the world had just labeled me non-essential. And I was sitting in a chair at my house. I said, I'm non-essential. I go from standing ovations and audiences to non-essential. I don't need to tell you how humbling that was. And I sat there. I said, okay, after COVID, what can I do for God? How, how can I rise? See, after I had a chance to do what I call the new triple R, the new triple R, which I think will make us all great as we walk with our lives, our families that working with God, the new triple R, here it goes. Have time, which is what COVID gave us to reflect, then to hit reset, and then to rise stronger. It was the first time since I was a teenager that I'd had time for Coach COVID, as I call him, because I call him Coach, because he's calling all the plays. Coach COVID sat me on a bench for a few minutes. He said, you're going to sit there and you're going to watch the game from the bench, and you're going to think about some decisions that you made and how God can use you a little better afterwards. So I sat there on a day having a pity party for myself, and I said, well, what title? Like, am I a speaker? Am I an entertainer? And then I said, no, 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 I'm a teacher. That's what it is. I'm a teacher. That's honorable. I'm kind of like a pastor, but I don't have a church. I can't say pastor. I was struggling all day thinking, what am I? Who am I now? And I know that a lot of you watching this message right now, a lot of you, your whole life has been shaped. Your identity has been shaken in this moment that we're in right now. Later that day. See, because God always knows when your heart is troubled. 
That's what I want you to know. I love knowing that I'm a Christian because God always knows when your heart is troubled. No matter, let me show you how I use a little six-year-old girl. Me and my daughter, Dory, we go for a little drive on our bike and we stop past this gentleman's house. His name's Matthew and he kind of looks like Dave Matthews a little bit. He's playing a guitar. He's very good. He was on his porch playing a guitar during COVID for our community just to give people some respite, some relief. We stop past, we're listening to his song and then all of a sudden we pull up. And Dory is just listening to him. He's playing that guitar. And as soon as he stopped, I said, hey, Mr. Matt, this is my daughter Dory right here. He said, hi, Dory. They met. She looked at him. She said, do you, do, do you play your guitar on stage? He said, well, yeah, I do. That's what I do for a living. She said, you, you get paid to live on stage? She said, you get paid to play on stage? She goes, my daddy, he, he lives on stage also. Do you want to know what my daddy does for a living? Do you want to know, Mr. Matt, what my daddy does? She paused just long enough to turn and look up at Matt. And I looked down at her because I was curious. What do I do, Dory? Who am I? Give me my title. She looked at me. She looked at Matt. And she said, Mr. Matt, my daddy is a story maker. He makes stories. Mr. Matt said, you mean storyteller? She said, no, no, no. He's a story maker. That's different. And I spent the next few days trying to figure out the difference between a storyteller and a story maker. And I realized how we are as Americans, how most of us, we're consuming stuff from the media. We just turn the TV on. Our brains are on autopilot. Social media, we're just scrolling. And see, here's what happens with most storytellers. You see these stories, you see people, you just kind of regurgitate the story as you heard it, right? That's what, most, that's what most, most storytellers do. We've got this great, amazing Bible that we get to read from Jesus. That's some of the best stories ever that shapes our life. But God put it on my heart. He said, Morris, to be a story maker, you have to own the story. He said, Morris, to be a story maker, you have to live out what I put inside of you. So for those of you who are kind of following in your notes, I want you to see something to understand something. Listen. God doesn't need, he didn't need you or me. He doesn't need any of us to be story makers. That's the reality. Because when Jesus got on that cross for us, he shifted the whole story. He shifted the whole entire narrative. And his whole message today is around us being a story maker. But how can we disrupt ourselves so we can see ourselves differently? And walk with Jesus. And you guys have to understand the importance of it. Because see, here's what happens with me. Most people, they know that my story precedes me before I even walk into a place. I was orphaned in New York City. Now, backstory, real simple. My mother and father were not involved with the cleanest of industries business-wise. It started in Chattanooga, Tennessee. My father was my mother's boss. And let's just say she sold products that were of herself. And they ended up on the deuce. This is what we would call 42nd Avenue in New York City, a place called the deuce. This is where more prostitution and drugs, everything went through New York City right there. My father, I just learned, by the way, just five months ago through Ancestry.com and through 23andMe, I just learned that my father's name was Maurice Morgan. I was named after him. My mother called me Morris instead of Maurice. My father and all seven of his brothers all ran prostitution in New York City and Manhattan. And here's what you got to understand. I still don't know how it happened, but I was able to get some information on my mother, and, and, and it got to me that I received my mother's day planner from 1981 when she died. And I noticed all these doctor's appointments in her day planner. And then it became clear what most of them were. They weren't health checkups. They were appointments that my mother was making so that once she walked into that doctor's office, she could walk out of the doctor's office and consume business as usual on the streets of New York City. And I have no idea. Yes, I do have an idea. Because see, here's how God works. After all the abortions, I have no idea how it happened. But my mother, she carried me for nine months safely in her little tiny belly at a moment when that wasn't good for business. That was the first thing she did. The second thing she did, here's the second thing she did. She gave me a name. My name is Morris Morrison. You already know that, though. I was raised with a cousin named Bam Bam and Dwight White in Fairmont, West Virginia. Nobody forgot who we were. She gave me a name. But the third thing my mother gave me, see, the, 
Here's the story that we know it as of now. My mother and my father got into it with some Italians called the Mafia. And as we know, there were five crime families that ran New York City at this point, specifically drugs and prostitution. It was a dangerous situation. They needed to get me out of New York City. They found safe haven in a place called Fairmont, West Virginia. A lady named Gwendolyn Sanders would take me in as her own and raise me, along with her sister, Dorothy Jean. Gwendolyn had a son named Chuck who became my foster dad. And somehow, because of a series of horrible laws that were passed in the 90s that impacted black and brown communities dramatically, things like three strikes and you're out laws, mandatory minimum sentences that disparage drastic differences between white cocaine powder and crack cocaine. We don't know how it happened, but my father Chuck was falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit, shooting a guy in the hand, and he received almost 100 years in prison. And his mother Gwendolyn, she died a few weeks later after that. His prison sentence, it crushed her. And what I love about this moment is that I had already started to have a relationship with Christ. But you need to know the exact moment that God grabbed me and took a hold of my heart. You need to know that or else it won't make sense or else the dime that I wear around my necklace won't make sense. People say, Morris, what's with the dime? What's with the dime? I say, well, hey, I'm a point guard in basketball. I love dropping dimes. And for those of you who are like, did he say dropping dimes? It's called the assist. Everybody say it. Say the assist. I love making the assist. But here's how it goes. I got curly hair. Nobody knew how to cut my hair. So by the time I was 10 or 11, got a pair of clippers, started shaving my hair myself. Did a horrible job, by the way. But after a couple of years, you know, so I started shaving it. It kind of looked like yours at first. What's your name? Robert. Robert. Everybody say, hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. And then eventually I learned how to style it a little bit. And I had no idea that curly hair was the hardest hair to cut. So before you know it, all of my white friends on the basketball team, my black friends, everyone wanted me to cut their hair. I started making a lot of money cutting hair. So between that and shoveling snow and cutting grass, and I also collected cans and I recycled them. So between that, by the time I was a teenager, I always had money. And I was thankful for that. But that little church of God that Francis and Eddie White took me to, it closed by the time I was 13. And one day, one day, God put it on my heart to walk through the snow to this tiny little church of God up on the hill. And there was only like seven people that went to this church and they were all white and they were older with silver hair. And I thought the place smelled like mothballs. It smelled real funny. So when I walked in, I was sitting on the back row because I didn't, I didn't really want to interact. And one day they passed that collection plate around to me. And as soon as that collection plate hit me, I gave in an offering for the first time of my life. And I remember God said, give now. I reached in, I took all the money I had out of my pocket and I dropped it in a collection plate. And then I said, nah, I need some of that back. I took some back. <laughs> Guys, that moment changed my life. And, and I want to make sure we understand why it changed my life. You know, once you understand the power of living generously, then you'll start to understand how living generously and generosity, how it completely, it, it changed my faith in God because when you give, there's faith that's associated with it and there's hope that comes from it. And I want you to know something. Our hope is tied to not only what we invest in, but our hope is tied to what we expect. So in this moment, I want, I want to be really clear. This is not a message about prosperity. This is not a give and you will get type of message. Now, that's not what this is about. But this is about the fact that God doesn't want or need your money. He wants your heart. And if you can put your trust in Jesus... And then learn how to love your neighbors as yourself. You'll start to see some of those same fruits of the spirit in your life. And I want to make sure you guys understand something. The most powerful thing that disrupted my life was generosity. I was raised poor. We didn't have much. And my grandmother, she gave me everything she could. I want you guys to turn your Bible to 1 Samuel, first chapter. Verse 9. And as you guys get ready to, to read along with me, I want to give you guys a little setup for what's happening here. So this is in the Old Testament. 
which means for you new believers or people out there watching, this is before Jesus came. The reason why we're, we're about to read this is because I believe that the day in the world that we live in right now, we need love and we need generosity and kindness more than ever before. And so as I prepare for this message, God put it on my heart. He said, Morris, you're going to go straight to 1 Samuel. And I said, what? And I sat there and read it and I learned what Hannah did. See, Hannah had a husband named Elkanah and then he had a second wife named, some people call her Panina, some people call her Panina. I'm going to call her Panina. But the problem is Panina, she was having a lot of babies and she was happy. A wife who was having babies and Hannah couldn't have kids. So what you're about to see is what Hannah did in a prayer that she made. Join with me as we read this, please. 1 Samuel, verse 9. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest, he was a priest, he was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and don't forget me, don't, don't forgive me, but give me a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept praying and she kept praying and she kept praying to the Lord. And Eli, the priest, he observed her mouth and he was watching her. And I think in this moment, he didn't really understand what was going on. So here's what happened next. Hannah was praying in her heart and then her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And I'm going to pause right there. In my spirit, I want to share this with you. There's some people who are watching this right now, and you feel like you're at places in your life where you're speaking up and you're screaming. But nobody hears you. That's not how God works. He always hears you. Eli thought she was drunk, and he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Now, see, Eli was even a priest, and so he's overly judging her. How, how long are you going to be drunk? Put away your wine. He had no idea. See, I just want to warn you guys. Sometimes you'll meet people in your life, and you'll come across people who you don't really know their full story, but they've got a burden or something so heavy that they're carrying that you may not always understand that there's something else going on. As we go ahead and get down to verse, 19, verse 15, We'll go ahead. It says, not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of great anguish and great grief. And then Eli, the priest, he answered. He said, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. And then she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and she ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And early the next morning they rose and they worshiped before the Lord and they went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah, he made love to his wife Hannah and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And I'm going to read this last part to you. And some of you who are watching online, you're thinking, where is Morse's face? Why can't I see the screen? Listen, you don't need to see me right now. You need to see God's word on the screen right now because that's the only thing we need in our country. I believe if we turn our faces back towards Jesus, all the answers are right here for us. So here we go. Watch this, watch this, watch this. When her husband went up to her, uh, went up with all of his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. And she said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay there until you have weaned him. Only make the Lord, uh, only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. And after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, although with a three-year-old bull and an ephah, a flower, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. Remember, he's the priest. And she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I'm the woman who stood here beside you. Remember me? Remember I was praying that day? Remember? Remember? I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. And he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped 
the Lord there. If you don't mind it, I'll be direct for a moment. I have a question for you. Are you giving everything you can to God? Or are you like me? Because see, sometimes I struggle and wondering if I'm giving everything that I, giving my best to God and what else is there that I can give to God. But see, here's what Hannah showed us in the Old Testament in Scripture. She showed us that the fastest way to disrupt ourselves is to give, even when you don't want to give. Now, at an early age, I learned the power of generosity, but I only gave a few bucks that day in the offering. Hannah gave a son. She literally, she literally gave a son. And I know right now some of you are thinking, you're wondering, what are some ideas in terms of what can you give and what God wants for you? And some of you are following along in your notes, so I'll say this to you. Three things that God wants us to give to him, and it's real simple. God wants you to love him. He wants you to give your love to him. Number two, God wants you to believe in his son Jesus and what he did on the cross. Number three, God wants you to love each other. And speaking of loving each other, I want you guys to turn with me to Galatians 5, verse 13. I'll give you guys a moment who are watching virtually a chance on your Bible app to go ahead and swap over and grab the verse. And as you guys are all turning, as you guys are all looking to it, let me give you the setup here. So this is Galatians 5. This is Paul who blessed us with most of the New Testament. This is Paul who's speaking to all of the new believers throughout Galatia. And this is important for you. We have a lot of new believers who are tuning in. We got some old believers who need to be reminded of the simple thing that Paul was trying to teach in Galatia that day, which is there's only one place we get freedom. And that's from the freedom of Jesus Christ, not the Old Testament law. And Paul's going to go on to tell us that we need to love each other as we, as we love ourselves, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let's get ready to read the word. Verse 13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. Notice how he starts with the verse of reminding us what we were meant to be, by the way. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourselves. If you bite and devour each other, watch out and you will be destroyed by each other. It's almost as if Paul wrote that message for us today in 2020. When we look at the lack of unity that's existing in the world right now, when we look at how divided we are, when we look at what's going on in the world one day, you know, Hanuel showed us in 1 Samuel the importance of giving, but right now Paul is showing us that we're devouring each other. And here's why. See, I believe one of the best things you can give God right now in this moment today, one of the best things you can do to be generous to the entire world around us is to simply remind us that God called us to love our neighbors as ourselves. Love. That's it. It, it doesn't need to be anything more important than that. Listen, I want to make sure you guys understand this. Last month on Father's Day, there's something dramatic that happened in a small southwest PA town. Uniontown, PA. There was a muscular African-American brother, Dalen McLee. He's got tattoos. He's got long braided hair. Dalen is an imposing brother. He's strong. Now, Dalen's story starts at around maybe about three years ago. He was at an event and he noticed before everyone noticed that there was a man at the event who had a gun. And Dalen he literally was the hero in this moment. He de-armed the man. He took the gun from the man, saved the day. The man later said he was there to shoot up the whole entire place. But the problem is as Dalen stripped the gun from him, the cops arrived. And all they saw was Dalen with the gun. They arrested him immediately. He faced 15 years in prison. He spent a year and a half fighting his case. But because there was footage from a cell phone and from cameras, the jurors leaned his way. He was freed, but during that, that year and a half he was away, he lost his own mother. As soon as he was released from prison, Dalen was also sitting on the porch with some of his friends when unidentified cops came up to harass them, beat them, and they got Dalen to the ground. This is the second episode. Kicked him in the face several times and disfigured him somewhat. Had to get to, Listen, it was a dramatic situation. Once again, they thought he was someone else. Once again, there was a camera. There was a camera that freed him from that situation. Now, as we speak, Dalen has civil lawsuits against several police forces. But what you need to know is what happened just about a month ago on Father's Day. Dalen, 32 years old, he was visiting his own father on Father's Day. And as he's visiting his father, he hears a loud crash outside of the house. 
And as soon as he walks outside of the house, he sees that a police officer just hit head on in a collision with another pedestrian. Several people ran to the officer's car. They tried to get the cop out of his car. And as they were trying to pull him out, the inside of the car got on fire. And they knew there was about to be an impending explosion. There was another officer on the scene who was trying to get his own officer brother out. And he backed up and the whole audience backed away. And that's when Dalen came out. And he looked over and he saw that the, the, the cop was in the car. Dalen ran over. He did his best to pry the door off of this cop's car. And then when he couldn't really, he reached in and he pulled the cop out of the car. He rescued him to safety. Now here's the thing. ABC News, NBC News, everybody's covering the story right now. But there's one line why I'm telling you the story. They ask him because everybody knew Dalen's past. And by the time the news came, they said, wait a minute. Aren't you that guy with the lawsuits you, you, who had all this stuff happen to you from the cops? They said, you risked your life when other people were standing by. You could have died in that explosion with the cop. Why did you do that? He said because he's a child of God. He's a human being just like me. And he deserves love. I'm going to tell you all right now what I'm begging you to do. Some of you don't have to give a baby like Hannah did. It's not even money that God is asking from some of you. Some of you will never have the strength or the courage. God may not have created you to go into a burning car to save someone. But I'm going to give you three things that I believe if we all as a Christian church family decide to make it a priority. Something that we can all generously give. And it's going to take a lot of generosity for you to do it. Number one, you guys watch me on this. I'm asking number one as a church family throughout this world that we make a decision to give, give away our desire to be right. Righteousness. We all feel, see, I find it ironic that on one hand, we all have this intense desire to be right, but on another hand, everybody's so offended today. Everybody has something to say. Everybody wants to be right. Everyone has opinion. Yet the moment someone says something that's contradictory or descending to what you think you believe, even as a Christian, we write them off. Oh, yeah, and we're in America. As you know, here in America, we love our American rights. Oh, we love our American rights. Trust me, I love our American rights too. But see, I'm calling a different person today. Here's what I'm saying today. I know that there are people who've not yet decided to walk with Jesus yet. You're watching this right now. I know there are Christians who've made a decision, and you've gone public with the world, and you said, I'm a Christian. Okay. All right. If that's good, remember, I'm asking you to give away your need to be right. Because when you do that and we do the second thing, which you decide to give grace to others. See, all of a sudden, you remind me what Pastor Dan said to me right here as we prayed yesterday. Pastor Dan said, Morris, we can't preach love without humility. So let me be clear to three things I'm asking you to give. Give away your desire to be right. Give some grace to people when they offend you and when people say something that you don't even necessarily agree with. But number three, give humility to the world around you. Listen, I'm going to be real honest. I struggle with judging others a little bit more than I should. And I would like to hang my hat on and say, see, here's what happened. See, what had happened was I lost parents when I was little. Then I lost a second set of parents and I didn't have anybody protecting me. So I had to be able to assess or discern or judge situations. And my wife reminds me all the time. She says, Morris, you need to let that go. During COVID on one of my reflection days this year, I sat there and God whispered into my spirit. He said, Morris, I need you to do something for me. You need to listen to people as if. Everything they're saying is correct. Now, I know that wasn't just for me because I throw myself on the cross when it comes to this one. I struggle with judgment. And we're watching our world devour and tear each other apart right now. Paul gave us the roadmap and he showed us what happens as we go back. And we continue to read. I want you guys to do me a favor to come down for a minute. Give me a second, please. We're going to get ready 
And we're going to come to Galatians 19 as we finish reading this place right here. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions. Kind of sounds like our country right now. And envy and drunkenness and orgies and everything. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace and forbearance, which is another word for patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. And if you guys want some clear information on something you can do to really show that you love your neighbor. Number one, just be nice. We don't have to complicate the situation. Be nice. Number two, be real. I've got a lot of white friends who are calling and reaching out to me, and they're asking, well, Morris, can I say this? Can I say that? Can I do this? Can I do that? I tell everyone, be real. Because it's in your heart anyway, and we already know that. Just be real. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Number three, be direct. We have lost the art of communication to a large degree in this country. We're swiping and some people doing other things while they're swiping. The ability to get with your brother, who you may disagree with, and stand up for a second. As I look at you, to get with your brother and stand and look at him, squared up shoulder to shoulder and say, I'm sorry, but I don't see it that way. But, man, I'm willing to listen. And after listening, if you guys just listen to what your pastor taught you a month ago, he said that for those of us out there who want to help racism and help America come together, number one, we need to listen. And number two, we need to lament with each other. Those of you who don't know that, that's the fancy word of saying when you listen to somebody, you got to feel their words and you got to let their words in. But number four, just be positive. There are many of you who are like me who judge. And the best thing you can do is just be positive and not see the negative in people and give them the grace. Or or not see the negative in a group of people because we just wipe everybody with a broad paint brush applications. Guys, I'm going to tell you something as I get ready to close. I love the fruits of the Spirit. I love the idea that every day that we kill our flesh, we can get closer and closer to living like Jesus has called us to. But there's one word in all those fruits of the flesh that, that proves of the spirit that comes out and that's faithfulness. I get to, as a Christian, no matter what I go through, I get to know and believe and to understand that God will always be faithful to me. I get a chance to be faithful back with God through all things. And the best thing I can tell you about disrupting yourself, and one of the reasons why I feel like God has called me to live this message is God has continued to disrupt me throughout my life, even when I didn't see things coming. I'll tell you this, just after we got married, my wife and I lost a set of twins. And it was one of the hardest things I've ever gone through in my life. We almost divorced over it. And one day we had a conversation at the table and my wife pointed at the Bible and I know that she was kind of angry at God at this time and she was trying to process what had happened in our Bible and we had this long conversation. But later on that weekend we were driving to church and then we were doing this huge offering at church for this expansion and the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. He said, Morris, hand your wife the checkbook so that she can activate her faith. We had this separate checking account that we used, Ben. It was for my dad, Chuck. We figured that if we didn't get our own money to hire a fancy attorney, we couldn't get rid of a 100-year sentence. He had been in prison at this point almost 20 years. Lisa looked at me. She said, how much from the account? And here's what God had put on my heart. God asked me a question. He said, son, are you going to trust me with your dad? I looked at Lisa and I said, all of it. And that day when we got to church and my wife dropped that check in the basket, my pastor, Joel Delf, he looked at me and he said, what are you asking God for? And I know God is faithful. I know that no matter what, God will never leave my side. My wife and I looked at each other and I looked at her and I said, I'm asking, I'm asking God for my wife's salvation. We're asking God for the birth of a child. And we're asking for my father's freedom. The very next week, 
the very next week, not three weeks later, not a month later, not two months later, the very next week I got to stand there during worship like you guys sing the amazing worship songs and I watched my wife with both of her hands in the sky and I watched her ask for Jesus to be her personal savior. And then weeks after that we found out we were pregnant with the daughter that we would go ahead and name Dorothy Jean. We call her baby Dory. And then a short time after that we found out that the courts and a judge was sympathetic to my father's case that they reopened. And my father is now a free man. God, and speaking of faithfulness, my little daughter, Dory, she's only six, but she loves God so much. And Karen, what we did that day was we planted a seed for God's future kingdom. You guys don't believe me? <laughs> Take a look at this video. Wait till she's, Dory's got her own special message for every single one of you right here, right now. We're going to take a look at this video. My name is Dory, and I just got my dime necklace from my dad. And this dime necklace, the story, is very important. It means to be generous, nice, follow the fruits of the Spirit, and to give 10% back to God. I don't want you to touch your phone. I don't want you to do any of that. Not text, not call, just... Spend your time reading Bible, writing, building stuff, going outside and playing with your friends. That's what you're supposed to be doing. I hope you take this things and words wherever you go. Thanks. See you later. Right now is a special moment. You guys know this is, this is, this is where it all happens. This is where we get that opportunity to show you all that church today wasn't just about some show. And there are, there are many of you watching online right now. You're going to get that same opportunity that I've received and that everyone in this room has received. And that there are people out there watching throughout the world right now who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the problem with that. Sin separates us from God. And God knew that, so he let his only son Jesus die for us. So in this next moment right now, it's going to be a big moment. See, we're going to get a chance to stand as a church, and we're going to bow our heads and say a simple prayer so that the people out there who want to make the important decision to let Jesus come into their hearts, they can do it right now. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it as a church family, and some of us are going to re-say this prayer, and we've said it before, but there's some people who are going to say it for the first time. So right now, if you're in your car, if you're at the gym, if you're at home, if you're looking at your spouse, wherever you're at right now, you have an opportunity to let Jesus come into your heart. So if we can all bow our heads and close our eyes, we're going to get a chance to say a simple prayer right now. And we're going to welcome some new people into our family. And this prayer goes like this. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. Repeat after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus died for the forgiveness of my sins. Dear Jesus, please come into my heart and walk with me for the rest of my life. Amen. See, right now, there's some people who just said that prayer. Can I just, can we get a little clap and some celebration for a moment? We got some new people in the family that are going to call themselves Christians and they're going to self-identify and they're going to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. But we have a moment right now to worship as we think about the people throughout the world who just joined our family. Upon you and a thousand generations, your family and your children and their children and their children, may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations, your family, your children and their children. Children, may his favor be upon you. 
Thank you for the people who made decisions today to walk the rest of their lives and join this special family that has a chance to honor God for what Jesus did for us with his gospel on the cross. And please bless us all as we all walk and we go forth and give us safety as we do it while we love our neighbors and love each other. Many of you are going to know someone who's recently made a decision to follow Christ. And if that's you, make sure they get plugged into a great church like Grace Church Reno and all the many churches throughout the world where people have an opportunity, where you have an opportunity to continue to grow as a Christian and to figure out more about what this gospel, about what Jesus did and why it's all we need to make it through today. Please be, be well. Peace be with you. Holla at your boy. See y'all later. Thank you.